صلوا على محمد وآل محمد A second salawat for the love of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib. <clears throat> A third salawat in honor of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam and his noble companions in the loudest of your voices. <clears throat> أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على محمد وآله الطاهرين صلى الله عليه وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين صلى الله عليك يا رسول الله صلى الله عليك يا سيدي ويا مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة ويا عبرة كل مؤمن ومؤمنة يا ليتنا فيا ليتنا كنا معكم سيدي فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال تعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يوفون بالنذر ويخافون يوما كان شره مستطيرا ويطعمون الطعام على حبه مسكينا ويتيما وأسيرا إنما نطعمكم لوجه الله لا نريد منكم جزاء ولا شكورا إنا نخاف من ربنا يوما عبوسا قمطريرا صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوا على محمد وآل محمد According to most Shia commentators and many Sunni commentators of the Holy Quran Verses 5 to 22 of Surah Al-Insan were revealed in praise of the family of the Holy Prophet. It is reported that Imam Al-Hasan and Imam al Hussein, when they were young, they became very ill to such an extent that the Holy Prophet was concerned about them and he visits them along with a group of his companions. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi sees their condition and he suggests to Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib that he performs a nadr that invoke Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and make an oath that if Hassan and Hussein recover from their illness, you will fast for three consecutive days. Ali ibn Abi Talib, Fatima al-Zahra, Fidda, and even Imam al-Hassan and Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, they decide to perform this nadr together as a family. They make this vow that if Allah gives us health, if He restores our health, we will fast for three consecutive days. After a short while, Hassan and Hussein alayhim as-salat was salam. La basallu ala Muhammad wa alayhim wa They recover from their illness. And therefore, in fulfillment of their oath, Ali, Fatima, Fidda, Hassan and Hussein decide to begin their three-day fast. 
There was no food in the house of Ali and Fatima on the day that they wanted to begin their fast. So Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he goes and he borrows barley. Can you imagine that in the early years in Medina, there was a lot of poverty. Amir al-Mu'mineen borrows barley so they can have something to eat for iftar that night. He brings it back to the house. He gives it to Lady Fatima alayhi salam. Lady Fatima takes one third of it, one third of the barley. She grinds it to make flour and then she bakes bread. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, that day he goes to the masjid to pray Salatul Maghrib with the Holy Prophet. And then he returns. The bread has been baked. There are five loaves of bread that have been prepared. Amir al-Mu'mineen brings the bread, he places it in front of all of his family members. And as they are about to break their fast, there is someone standing at the door. Someone from behind the door calls out, As-salamu alaykum ya ahla bayti Muhammad. Peace be upon you, O the household of Muhammad, miskinun min masakin al-Muslimin. I am a poor Muslim. أَطْعِمُونِي مِمَّا عِنْدَكُمْ أَطْعَمَكُمُ اللَّهِ مِنْ مَوَائِدِ الْجَنَّةِ Give me some food. I'm hungry. And Allah will give you of the food of paradise. Amir al-Mu'mineen, Fatima al-Zahra, Hassan and Hussein, they take not just one loaf of bread. They could have given this miskeen one loaf of bread, and they would have satiated him. They all decide to give away their bread. Meaning Ahlul Bayt when they give, they don't just give you the bare minimum. They give you more than what you even expect. This is what happens on the first day. So they break their fast on water. Can you imagine how difficult that is? The next day, Amir al-Mu'mineen goes to the masjid. Prays Maghrib with Rasulullah, returns. Fatima to Zahra takes one third of the barley, grinds it, makes flour, bakes the bread. Five loaves of bread. They're about to break their fast. At the time of Maghrib, someone is standing at the door again, but it's a different person. It seems that this miskeen mentions that if you want generosity, come to this house. As-salamu alaykum ya ahla bayti Muhammad. There is a caller at the door. Ana yatimun. I am an orphan. Min al-muhajirin. I am an orphan from the migrant Muslims who came to Medina from Mecca. And my father was a shaheed. I am a child of one of the sahaba who was martyred. At'imuni. أَطْعِمُونِي شَيْئًا أَطْعَمَكُمُ اللَّهِ مِنْ مَوَائِجِ الْجَنَّةِ Give me some food so that Allah will grant you the food of paradise. The second day, you know there's a hadith that says الْأَجْرُ عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ الْمَشَقَّةِ That your reward is proportionate to the hardship. The second day, giving the iftar was more difficult than the first day. The thawab is even more now. And the recipient is someone who is even more vulnerable. Someone who is yatim. They give the bread. The third day, two days, no food, just water. Amir al-Mu'mineen goes to the masjid, Lady Fatima to Zahra, bakes the bread. And something amazing happens on this third day. You know, sometimes we read these verses and we think, oh, someone who was in need was given bread each, each day. The third day, they're about to break their fast. There is someone at the door. As-salamu alaykum ya ahla bayti Muhammad. Tu'assiruna wa la tut'imuna. أَطْعِمُونِي فَإِنِّي أَسِيرُ مُحَمَّدْ أَطْعَمَكُمُ اللَّهِ مِنْ مَوَائِدِ الْجَنَّةِ The third was an asir, a captive. 
The first day, who was asking for food? A Muslim. The second day, who was asking for food? A Muslim. The third day, who was asking for food? A Muslim or a non-Muslim? A non-Muslim. Not only is it a non-Muslim, this is an Asir, a captive. In the early days in Medina, there were no prisons. There were no prisons. This is someone who fought against Rasulullah in battle, was captured as a prisoner. Because there were no prisons, prisoners were taken into custody by Muslim families in Medina. Some of the Muslim families did not have enough food to feed these captives. So some of them would roam in the streets. Ahlul Bayt, two days of hunger, two days of having only water to break their fast. They give their food to who? To a non-Muslim. A non-Muslim who is a combatant non-Muslim. This shows you, my dear brothers and sisters, that Ahlul Bayt السلام, teach us that the right to food is a human right. That even if the one who's extending his hand is a non-Muslim, not just a non-Muslim, someone who fought Rasulullah, someone who is a captive, Ahlul Bayt, they don't just give him one loaf of bread. They gave him the same amount of food that they gave to the orphan Muslim, to the poor Muslim. This highlights, my dear brothers and sisters, that in the Islamic tradition, food is a basic human right. There's a hadith from the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wa Sallu Ala Muhammad Wa If I can ask the brothers to move as close as you can to the member. There's no extra charge to sit close to the member. So please come forward so we can make room for the brothers who are making their way into the center. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. The question is, my dear brothers and sisters, what is the Islamic perspective? on the most basic human rights. There's a hadith from the Holy Prophet where he speaks about the most basic, baseline human rights. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi says, لَيْسَ لِبْنِ آدَمَ حَقٌ فِي سِوَى هَذِهِ الْخِصَالِ Every human being, is entitled to four things by virtue of being human. So this is something that, is, that should be afforded to all people, irrespective of their creed, their color, their socioeconomic background. This is what Islam says are the four most basic rights that should be granted to all people. Rasulullah says, Baytun yaskunu. Every human being has a right to shelter. Housing, number one. And we'll speak about each of these in a little bit more detail. Number two, The second most basic human right is the right to clothing. To have adequate clothing to protect you from the elements, from heat, from the cold. Something to cover your body. This is a human right in Islam. Proper clothing. Number three, Rasulullah says, وَجِلْفُ الْخُبْزِ Food. The Prophet says bread. And he says bread. You may ask him, why didn't the Prophet say fruits or vegetables? If you've ever been on a, on a diet where you only eat salad, you always feel hungry, huh? But bread, what does it do? It fills you up. Rasulullah says, people have a right to eat and alleviate their hunger. 
This is the third human right. That people have a right to eat, a right to food. And number three, water. Clean drinking water. Now the question is, we have over 7 billion people living in the world today. Where does the money come from to provide shelter to all of these people? To provide clothing to all of these people? To provide food and water to all of these people? Where does the money come from? You know, there are some people that have the attitude that, you know, people are poor because they're lazy, right? I've seen many, you know, Republican politicians. They have a disdain for the poor. And this is mentioned in the Quran. In Mecca, when the Prophet was encouraging people to give to the poor, when he was exhorting the wealthy to give a portion of their wealth to the less fortunate, what would be the answer? وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ In Surah Yasin, ayah number 47, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ أَنْفِقُوا مِمَّا رَزَقَكُمُ الله. Give of what Allah has given to you. It doesn't even belong to you to begin with. What do they say? قَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا Those who disbelieve, they say to the believers, أَنُطْعِمُوا مَنْ لَوْ يَشَاءَ اللَّهُ أَطْعَمَا It's not our problem. If Allah wants, He can deal with the problem. Allah, if Allah wanted to feed them, He can feed them. They feel no sense of responsibility to the poor. They feel that all of their wealth belongs to them. But what does Allah say in the Qur'an? He says the mu'min, the believer, understands what? In Surah Al-Ma'arij, verses 24 and 25. A beautiful verse. Allah says the mu'mineen, the believers are the ones, وَالَّذِينَ فِي أَمْوَالِهِمْ حَقٌّ لِلسَّائِلِ وَالْمَحْرُومِ That the believers understand that in their wealth, there is an acknowledged right to the beggar, and the deprived. Meaning, when you look at your money, you have to understand that a portion of your money doesn't even belong to you. That it belongs to who? It belongs to two types of poor people. Lisa'ili wal mahroom. There are two types of poor people. There are people who are poor and they ask you for help. This is what we call what? The beggar. People that beg you. They're so desperate that they're asking you for help. But the Qur'an, look at the precision of the Qur'an. Allah says, there is a right that has to be given to the beggar and the mahroom to the deprived. Meaning, there is another class of poor people. They are destitute. They don't have, but they don't ask. Don't assume that the faqir is the one who's, who's begging. There might be people in our community, you might see them, they dress well. They don't ask for help, but they're poor. And their sense of dignity and their pride prevents them from asking. Allah says you have to be attentive. Don't wait for people to ask you for help. Don't wait for people to become desperate. What does Amir al-Mu'mineen say? Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi alayhi, Allahumma salli alayhi. He says, لا يكلف أحدكم أخاه الطلب إذا عرف حاجته. Ali ibn Abi Talib, what does he say? He says, do not compel your brother to ask you if you already know he's in need. Don't make people ask you. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, do you think he was knocking on people's doors and asking them, do you need anything? He would give them. He would know. He would pay attention to the condition of the ummah. He would know who needs and who is in need even before they ask him. There has to be a sense of responsibility towards the less fortunate. Now, so this is the right to shelter. Now, so we want to speak about the right to shelter first. Rasulullah mentioned four things. The right to shelter, the right to clothing, the right to food, and the right to water. As for the right to shelter, brothers and sisters, do you know, and this was actually a shocking statistic, 
How many people do you think are homeless around the world? A recent study showed that there are 150 million people around the world who are homeless. 150 million people who are homeless. That means 2% of the world's population, they don't have shelter. Now, what is the definition of a homeless person? Typically, if you ask someone, who's homeless? Define what is homelessness? They say it's a person who sleeps out in the streets. They don't have a shelter. This is not what a homeless person is. In fact, you find that the definition of a homeless person is someone who does not have permanent housing. A homeless person may be sleeping in the street. A homeless person may be occupying an abandoned building. A homeless person may be sleeping in their car. Yes, there are people in our communities. You don't know about them. They come to the masjid. They get in their car. You think they're going home, but they are already home. They sleep in their cars. There are people that live in shelters. They're still considered homeless. This is, this is an unstable, this is temporary housing. It's important for us to know that this is a serious problem in our communities. And when I say our community, I'm talking about the human community. Do you know, brothers and sisters, when Rasulullah migrated from Mecca to Medina, what was the first thing that he did? He arrives in Medina. The Muhajireen arrive in Medina. They were religiously persecuted in Mecca. They are arriving in Medina with only the clothes on their back. They have nowhere to go. Before building the masjid, what does the Prophet do? He resolves the homeless problem. How does he do that? Before they put the first brick to build Masjid and Nabi, what does the Prophet do? The Prophet establishes brotherhood between the Muhajireen and the Ansar. What does this brotherhood mean? This migrant Muslim who has come from Mecca into Medina doesn't have money, doesn't have a house. Rasulullah assigns an Ansari Muslim to a Muhajiri Muslim. What does it mean when the Prophet assigns them to each other? He lives with you. You give him shelter. And the Holy Quran describes the spirit of altruism. Can you imagine now? There are Muslims that come to Vancouver and they have nowhere to go. You as a mu'min, you don't send them to the shelter. You invite them into your house. Now you may, you may welcome them the first day, second day, but then after a few days, you know, you might just start, you consider them a burden. Look at how Allah describes the Ansar. Allah is speaking about the Ansar who are receiving the Muslims from Mecca who don't have shelters. Allah says, They love the Muslims who are coming to them. They love the fact that they are in a position to give their brethren shelter. وَلَا يَجِدُونَ فِي صُدُورِهِمْ حَاجَةً مِمَّا أُوتُوا And these Ansar, they did not feel any negativity in their hearts towards these Muhajireen. They're not saying, that, oh, they're taking up a room in my house or they're eating up all of our food. Allah says there was no haraj. They did it out of the kindness of their hearts. وَيُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ they preferred their brothers over themselves even if it meant that they are impoverished. So even if there was very limited space, they still did it. They gave them the best rooms in the house. It was the spirit of altruism. And it was on this occasion that Rasulullah assigns each Muslim to take care of another Muslim. The Prophet did this 
He guaranteed the right of shelter before they built the masjid. And the Prophet was assigning each Muslim to take care of an, a fellow Muslim until there was only one man left who was not assigned anyone to look after him. Ali ibn Abi Talib, who was 21 years old on that day, with tears in his eyes, he comes to Rasulullah. Ya Rasulullah, akhayta bayna ashabik. You assigned every Muslim a brother to look after him. But you left me. You did not assign anyone to me. Rasulullah says, Ya Ali, anta akhi fi dunya wal akhir. Oh Ali, you are my brother in this life and the next life. I reserved you for me, oh Ali. Ama tarza an takuna minni bi manzilati Harun min Musa. Don't you want to be to me as Harun was to Musa? So you see that the Holy Prophet, before building the masjid, secures this first human right for his community, the right to shelter. After the Prophet builds the masjid, there is still an influx of people. People are still coming to Medina. When, pe when there is no room for people to be taken into the homes of the Muslim community, what does the Prophet do? He designates a section in the masjid to house the homeless. The, they are known as Ashab al suffa There were Muslims who were living in the masjid. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa didn't kick them out. This is Baytullah, this is the house of Allah. So they were living at the masjid, the Prophet secured employment for them. He helped them get jobs so they can save money and achieve some sort of financial independence. The right to shelter. Now, number two, the Prophet mentions the right to clothing. People have a right to adequate clothing. The Holy Prophet ﷺ was known to always give the clothes off of his back to someone who he felt did not have adequate clothing. In fact, on one occasion, one of the companions of the Prophet says, I was walking with Rasulullah. Kuntu amshi ma'an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. La ba sallu ala Muhammad wa alayhi Muhammad. He says, I was walking with the Prophet. The Prophet was wearing a Yemeni cloak. It was given to him as a gift. A very expensive Yemeni cloak. There was a Bedouin Arab. These are the desert dwellers. You know, they don't have the best clothing. And some of them are very, you know, they're very unrefined in their mannerism. This Bedouin Arab saw this beautiful cloak of the Prophet and he starts to pull the, the abaya of Rasulullah. And he says to the Prophet that give me of what Allah has given you. And the Sahabi says that the man pulled on the cloak of the Prophet so aggressively that it left a red mark on the neck of the Prophet. This is how desperate some people were. How coerced they were with the Prophet. What does the Prophet say? He smiles at him, he takes it off, and he gives it to him. The Prophet didn't even rebuke him. Because he wanted to teach the Muslims that people have a right to adequate clothing. Now the question is, when we want to donate clothing to those who are less fortunate, how do we donate clothing? Do you know what we do? We think we're getting thawab for this. We go deep, deep into the, the closet. And we find the Christmas sweater, the ugly Christmas sweater from 1970, right? We take this and we say, I want to give this for the sake of Allah. This is how we give to the less fortunate. You know, Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib, when he would go to the marketplace with Qambar, who is his servant, Ali ibn Abi Talib, would spend more money on the clothes of Qambar than he would spend on his own clothes. He would want Qambar to dress better than him. This is how the Shia of Amir al muminin should be. That when you give, don't give rags. Give something that you would want to wear. 
Allah says in ayah number 92 of Surah Ali Imran, لَن تَنَالُوا الْبِرُ حَتَّى تُنْفِقُوا مِمَّا تُحِبُّونَ You will not achieve true piety until you give of what you love. Until you give of what you love. Do you know brothers and sisters in the Islamic tradition, there are two types of sins. There are sins that do not require kafara, and there are some sins that you have to pay kafara for. So for example, say you miss Salatul Fajr intentionally. You don't put your alarm on. You miss Salatul Fajr. You committed a sin. Do you have to pay kafara? There's no kafara. There are other sins that you commit a sin and you also have to pay kafara for it. For example, if you make an oath, you take a yameen, you say, Wallah, tomorrow I'm going to fast. And you don't fast. You committed a sin and you also have to do what? You have to pay kafara. Kafara to yameen. The Quran mentions the kafara for not fulfilling an oath. Allah in Surah Al-Ma'idah, ayah number 89, what does he say? Because in the Quran, sometimes Allah uses the word sayyi'ah, and sometimes he uses the word then or ma'asiyah. Usually sayyi'ah refers to sins that have kafara. Yukafir ankum sayyi'atikum. There's takfir there. So Allah says, فَكَفَارَتُهُ إِطْعَامُ عَشَرَةْ masakin. If you invoke the name of Allah, that you're going to do something and you don't fulfill it, the kafara is, you either give food to ten poor people. And Allah doesn't say that they have to be Muslims. Any poor people. إِطْعَامُ عَشَرَةْ masakin مِنْ أَوْسَةِ مَا تُطْعِمُونَ أَهْلِيكُمْ أَوْ كِسْوَتُهُمْ Or you give clothes to 10 poor people. Or or you release a slave. All three of them are what? They're related to other people. You're alleviating the difficulties of others. You're raising the standard of living of others. If you're not able to do any of those, If you can't do any of those three, then you fast. For three days. Notice how Allah gives more priority to what? Alleviating the suffering of others than doing what? Rituals. Than doing these acts of worship. Allah says there are other things that take priority. Now, so we mentioned shelter. We mentioned clothing. Now what is left? Food. The right to food. Many of you are familiar with Ibrahim. Ibrahim is mentioned many times in the Quran. Ibrahim is the one who coined the term Muslim. Muslimin. He is the one who coined the term Muslim. He is the one who named this Ummah. He is mentioned throughout the Quran. The 14th surah of the Quran is named after him. He's one of the messengers, five messengers of great resolve. He is Khalilullah. He's the intimate friend of God. Rasulullah is asked, how did Ibrahim reach the status of being the friend of God? What did he do? Because Allah doesn't just arbitrarily give this honor to someone. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi says, He says, مَتَّخَذَ اللَّهُ إِبْرَاهِيمَ خَلِيلًا إِلَّا لِإِفْشَائِهِ السَّلَامِ وَإِطْعَامِهِ الطَّعَامِ وَصَلَاتِهِ بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّاسُ نِيَامِ Rasulullah says, there are three things that Ibrahim used to do regularly and as a result of these three deeds, Allah elevated him to the maqam of being the friend of God. The first is he used to spread peace. People fight with each other, he reconciles. He's a peacemaker. Some of us, we're not peacemakers. We fan the flames of fitna. Did you hear what this person said? We backbite each other. 
we spread gossip, we instigate, we fracture the community. Ibrahim was a peacemaker. Number two, the Prophet says what? He used to feed people. He used to feed people. And he used to pray at night. Ibrahim had a habit. Whenever he would prepare food, he would go outside to see if there's anyone who would join him and eat with him. He would always want to eat with someone. He was very social. On one occasion, he invites someone to a meal. It turned out that the guy was kafir. Ibrahim wasn't aware of it. So he says, let us mention the name of God before we begin eating. Let us thank him for his ni'mah. The man says, I don't believe in God. I refuse to mention the name of a Lord that I don't believe in. Ibrahim says, I'm sorry. If you don't express gratitude to God, I have to kindly ask you to leave. I'm not comfortable sharing my meal with you. He leaves. Allah reveals to him. Ya Ibrahim, why did you kick him out? He has denied me all his life, but I have always fed him. I have been feeding him all his life, even though he rejects me. You couldn't even give him one meal. How can you be my khalil? So after this day, Ibrahim realizes that food is a human right. Everyone has the right to food. Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, he says, in fact, feeding others is essential to your spiritual development. You think you're doing the poor a favor? Believe me, you're doing yourself a favor. Amir al-Mu'mineen, what does he say? He says, Utul ajsad al-ta'am. The nourishment for the body is food. Waqutul arwah al-ita'am. But the nourishment for the soul is to feed other people. It's to feed other people. There's a hadith from the Holy Prophet where he says, Ma amana bi wal yawm al akhir man bata shab'anan wa jaruhu ja'i. Rasulullah says, You are not a true believer in God. Nor are you a true believer in the day of judgment if you go to sleep with a belly that is filled with food while your neighbor is hungry. Your neighbor, not your Muslim neighbor, your Kafir neighbor, your Christian neighbor, your Jewish neighbor, your Hindu neighbor. You have to have concern. You have to pay attention to this right. Imam al Sadiq, he says, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad. You know, people always ask, is there something that I can do to guarantee Jannah? You know, people like guarantees. We're afraid of the Day of Judgment. That's why we like to read certain ziyaras, we like to, we like to read certain du'as, because we want this divine guarantee, this seal, that we will be granted paradise. Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq, he says, min mujibat al-Jannah wal maghfirah One of the things that guarantees a person admission into paradise. The Imam says one of the things that guarantees entrance into paradise is to give food to someone who is starving. Not just hungry. They're starving. They're on the brink of death. You save them. This is why Allah says, who is going to cross the obstacles on the Day of Judgment? How are you going to cross all of those checkpoints on the Day of Qiyamah? It's the one who releases slaves. It's to give food when there is famine. It's to give food to people who are starving. Now, we come now to the final right, the right to water. You know, brothers and sisters, the right to water is so important that you know when Amir al-Mu'mineen was fighting against Muawiyah in the Battle of Safin? Muawiyah 
had control of the river during that battle. And when Muawiyah was in control of the water source on that day, he denied Ali ibn Abi Talib and his soldiers access to water. As the battle continued, Ali ibn Abi Talib and his soldiers gained control of the water. When they gained control of the water, some of them said to Ali, now we can deprive them. Amir al-Mu'mineen says no. That is the difference between Ali and Muawiyah. Ali does not deny even his most fierce enemy water. This is a human right. In fact, people who used to come to the Prophet and say, Ya Rasulullah, I have so many sins. They come to the Prophet and say, Ya Rasulullah, I have sins that break the back. Do you know what the Prophet used to say to people who used to complain about excessive sinning? Rasulullah says, إِذَا كَثُورَتْ ذُنُوبُكْ فَاسْقِ الْمَاءَ عَلَى الْمَاءَ If you feel that you have accumulated a lot of sins, give water to people. Distribute water to people. And do it often. Because this will reduce the effect of those sins. This will make you worthy of Allah's forgiveness. We have a hadith from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam. We know from traditions from the Ahlul Bayt that the first thing that the human being will be questioned about on the Day of Judgment is what? Salah. In qubilat, qubila ma siwa. Wa in ruddat, rudda ma siwa. The first thing that you will be questioned about on the Day of Qiyamah is your salah. Your relationship with Allah. The most important relationship. But what is the first thing that people will be rewarded for on the Day of Judgment? Imam al-Baqir says, Inna awwala ma yubda'u bihi yawm al-qiyamah sadaqatu al-ma. The first thing that Allah will reward people for on the Day of Judgment is giving water to people. It's the first thing that Allah rewards. See how important this is? And this is a very relevant topic today. In the West, in the East, there are people that don't have access to drinkable water, to clean water. You don't need to go overseas, even in the United States, in Michigan, in Flint. There are people that don't have access to clean water. One of the biggest sins is to contaminate water, to force people to drink polluted water. Rasulullah, 14 centuries ago, he says, Water, drinking water is a human right. Do you know when it was recognized as a human right by the United Nations? Do you know when? Rasulullah, 14 centuries ago, he says water is a human right. July 2010, the United Nations declares, they declare, they agree to a new resolution that declares that it is a human right to have access to clean, drinkable water. 2010. What's even more interesting is that who voted in favor, who abstained, and who voted against. Do you know, it's all recorded. 120 countries voted in favor of declaring the right to water as a human right. 41 nations abstained. They didn't want to vote. No one voted no because no one wants to go on record for being shaitan, right? No one wants to go on record. 41 nations abstained. You know who abstained? Because they didn't want to take on the financial responsibility. Some developed countries who tried to block the passage of the resolution in hopes of minimizing their financial contributions. The United States. Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and many European nations. And there was a delegate from the UK who was listening to the conversations that were being held by representatives from these developed countries. They're saying, we don't want to spend money on toilets in Africa. 
These are the people that are running nations today who spend money on war, but they don't want to spend money giving human beings the right to drink water. And this is perhaps one of the greatest atrocities about the day of Ashura. On the day of Ashura, it was not just the Imam al Hussein who was denied water. It was not just the adults. It was also the children who were denied water on the day of Ashura. And one of those young children was Al Qasim. Al Qasim, the son of Imam al Mujtaba. The narrations say that Imam al Hussein, on the eve of Ashura, he has a conversation with Al Qasim. He calls upon him. Al Qasim was 11 years old or maybe 13 years old. Imam al Hussein, he calls his nephew. And he wants to test his nephew. So he asks him, Bunay Qasim, kayf al mawtu indak? Oh, my nephew, my beloved Qasim, what do you think of death? For tomorrow we will likely meet our deaths. Look at the answer of this young boy, the son of Imam al Hassan. What does he say when he is asked what he thinks about death? If dying means supporting you, then death to me is sweeter than honey. Allahu Akbar. On the day of Ashura, this young boy comes to his uncle. Sayyidi Aba Abdullah, give me permission to fight. Imam al Hussein, when he sees Qasim, his heart does not allow him to give permission to this young boy. He is the final reminder of his own brother, Imam al Hassan, in this world. He says to him that I cannot allow you to fight. You're a young boy. I cannot allow you to fight. The narration says Qasim with a heavy heart. He, he goes back into his tent and he retrieves a letter. He retrieves a letter that was written by Imam al Hassan alayhi salam and he gives it to Imam al Hussein. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he opens this letter and tears begin to stream from his eyes as he sees the handwriting of Imam al Hassan. In the letter, he addresses Qasim. He writes, Bunay Qasim, Ida shtaddat alayka al umur, fa alayka bi nusrati ammika al Hussein. O Qasim, on the day of Ashura, when you see your uncle without any helpers, I want you to help him and support him. Imam al Hussein alayhi salam, he embraces this young boy. The Imam alayhi salam, he has to help Al Qasim mount his horse because he was not able to mount it on, him, on his own. Hamid ibn Muslim, he says, on the day of Ashura, after the Sahaba fell, Slain on the plains of Karbala, I saw a young boy emerge from the camp of Hussein. A boy whose face was like a full moon on a dark night. He mounted his horse. He was not able to get on his horse on his own. It was Imam al Hussein who aided him and helped him mount the horse. He had his sword drawn. He was wearing a shirt. He was wearing trousers and he was wearing sandals. The narration say that this young boy on his horse proudly declares, he introduces himself to the army of Yazid. What does he say? He recites those famous lines of poetry. In tunkiruni fa'ana najlul hasan. سبط النبي المصطفى والمؤتمن 
هذا حسين كالأسير المرتان بين أناس لا سقو صوب المزان The narration say that this young boy he's able to kill 35 of the enemies the enemies become overwhelmed Umar ibn Sa'ad says surround him, put pressure on him the soldiers were saying that he's a young boy he's not even balig yet, leave him he's going to die of He's going to die of dehydration. They surround him as he's fighting. His sandal snaps. He lowers his head to fix his sandal. One of them strike him on his head. He falls on the plains of Karbala. He cries out to his uncle. Why does he cry to his uncle? Because he's a yatim. He's an orphan. He cries out to his uncle Hussein. Amma adrikni. Oh my uncle, come to me. Imam al Hussein rushes to him and he cradles him in his arms. His body is mutilated. Imam al Hussein begins to cry. He says, Ya Uzzu ala ammika al tadu'uhu fala yujibuk. It pains your uncle that you call him, but he cannot respond to you. Wa an yujibuk fala yu'inuk. And even if he responds to you, he cannot help you. And then the Imam says, May Allah punish those who killed you. And on the day of judgment, it will be your father, Hassan, and your grandfather, Rasulullah, who will plead against these killers. صلوا على محمد وآل محمد